Many a diamond makes a surprise appearance this Valentine's Day weekend. Just where those diamonds come from is a job for our David Pogue. When you think of diamonds, you probably picture this. Or this. Or this. You probably don't picture this. For hundreds of years, this is how we've gotten diamonds, by mining them. It's dirty, and it can be dangerous. And too often, it leaves the landscape looking like this. Even worse, diamonds have been used to fund wars across Africa, hence the terms conflict or blood diamonds. But you won't find any blood diamonds here, up in Canada. Way, way up in Canada. This is the Diavik Diamond Mine, just below the Arctic Circle. Our only access is via air. There are no roads, except for in the winter. We've got about uh, six weeks of ice road access. Gord Stevenson is Diavik's projects manager. Most people fly in, fly out every two weeks. So two weeks on site and then two weeks off. The challenge here is that the diamonds are beneath the bottom of a lake. The mine's owner, a company called Rio Tinto, had to build an enormous bowl-shaped dam almost a mile across to hold the water back before it could start mining. The result? Diavik is essentially an island on the floor of the lake. We can uh, get everything going. All right. We'll go around, we'll hit, hook up back to the D-ramp, then we'll keep on going down. It might seem complicated. Underground manager Curtis Dunford drove me into the mine through dark, spiraling tunnels. I guess it's no worse than the highway system. Until we were 1,700 feet below the surface. I'm not bored, I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's as far down as America's tallest building goes up. So he's not drilling for diamonds right now? Not right now, no. He's just developing a tunnel to get to the diamonds. Nicely done, sir. And finally, the mother load. And in that truck full right now, there's diamonds in that dirt? About 80 carats. 80 carats of diamonds? 80 carats. That's like... Yeah. 80 diamond rings in that truck. Yeah. I'm starting to see why this is an economical business. It is, yeah. The trucks carry the ore to the surface, where this plant crushes it into smaller and smaller pieces. And a high-speed x-ray machine sorts the diamonds from the worthless pebbles. And this is what it's all for. This is 10,000 carats of diamonds. This is about a half a day's output from the Diavik mine. The Diavik story began in 1994, when a young geologist named Ira Thomas led an exploratory expedition to the area. Her team was drilling through the ice to take samples of the lake floor when they got lucky. We found this two-carat diamond just sitting in the drill core. <laughs> I slept with it under my pillow uh, and woke up several times during the night just to make sure it was real and that I hadn't dreamt the whole thing. Honestly... Today, Thomas is the CEO of her own diamond company called Lucara. But for most of her career, she's been trying to help the diamond industry clean up its act. Trading conflict diamonds was a problem. However, we've worked incredibly hard as an industry, and not just in Canada, around the world. 98% of diamonds are now certifiably produced in non-conflict regions. But mining doesn't have a great environmental reputation either. What happens at the end of a mine's life? There is the expectation that the mines will be fully reclaimed and restored as much as possible to their original state. The whole mining industry has really evolved in that regard. But even if the diamond mining industry is becoming more ethical and less disastrous to the earth, it still has its critics. Then I guess... This will have to do. Maybe because the whole idea that you have to have a diamond in your engagement ring is relatively recent. I love this man. 
in 1939, only 10% of American men gave their fiancés diamonds. By 1990, 80% of men. All thanks to the advertising of one company, De Beers. Just about everything you think you know about diamonds comes from De Beers' ads. A diamond is forever. But lately, De Beers is facing some new low-cost competition. Diamond companies that never pull a single rock from the ground. Is it correct to say that these are synthetic diamonds? It's actually against FTC's rule to say anything like that. Mona Akavi is the CEO of Vray, a jewelry brand whose diamonds are grown in labs. Diamond is a diamond atomically exactly the same. Even with a microscope, a jeweler can't tell the difference. It's that identical. Just as little startups like Vray were getting underway, they learned that they were about to get some company in the diamond growing business, big company, called De Beers. Our jewels are created by science. Its new light box subsidiary sells lab-grown one-carat diamonds for $800 each, instead of about $6,000 for an identical diamond from the ground. Steve Coe is Lightbox's CEO. Isn't it risky to offer lab-grown diamonds at a lower price than naturally mined diamonds if you're the same company? This really opens up the opportunity to, to gift lab-grown diamonds uh, you know, many more sort of uh, frequent and regular gifting occasions. So, for example, not just birthdays with a zero on the end. You know, this is affordable enough that it could perhaps be every birthday. And where do De Beers Lightbox diamonds come from? This multi-million dollar plant outside Portland, Oregon. Our cameras were the first ones ever permitted inside. There's a diamond in each one of these big machines, right? There's a couple of hundred diamonds currently growing in each one of these machines. Oh, okay, okay. Adam O'Grady is in charge of the plant. He showed me how 21st century diamonds are born. So here we're taking our diamond seeds, diamond substrates, diamond plates. The process begins with thin diamond slices, like confetti, on this tungsten disc. This is like basically the cookie sheet. <laughs> you could call it that, yeah. This is the oven, actually a reactor, filled with superheated hydrogen and methane. Over the course of two weeks, the diamonds grow upward from those seed plates as they pull carbon atoms from those gases. Is this a peephole? Yeah, you're welcome to have a look. Oh man, it's like you're making a lot of little tiny muffins. Yeah, we're growing hundreds of stones in every reactor. When the disc comes out of the oven, it's full of those little black blobs. So it looks something like this. They still have that square shape, but they've obviously grown quite a bit higher. It's not gorgeous at this stage. No, it needs a bit more work before it's ready for the customer. Eventually, the stones will be measured, laser cut, and polished. And voila, real diamonds, atomically identical to the ones that formed deep underground two billion years ago. Typically, blue and pink stones just wouldn't be accessible to the standard consumer on the street. The price point is, is astronomical. This is a one carat blue diamond here? Yes. And that would not be $800 if it came out of the earth, you're saying? No way. <laughs> Lab-grown diamonds aren't just cheaper. They're also kinder to the earth. They're much less dangerous to workers, and their source doesn't get depleted after a few years, as all diamond mines eventually do. For the Dyavik mine, that'll be in 2025. Back at the Arctic Circle, Curtis Dunford is already planning for that day. What will happen to this whole network of tunnels? We'll flood it, and then we'll walk away from it. The only critters who will be here with what's left of the diamonds? Will be the fish. 